Hello. Lord Vader was subjugated to pain for the entire duration of his life after he lost to Kenobi on Mustafar. What would have happened if he had clothed himself? Would he return to the light or would he continue in the dark side? Special thanks to Art Savers for sponsoring our 75,000 subscriber lightsaber giveaway. All the details are in the pinned comment down below. Our story begins in silence. Vader was submerged in his back to tank. It wasn't long before that he was burning alive, skin ripped from flesh, and burn scars that ripped apart his lungs. Anakin Skywalker was dead, but maybe not as dead as some would have liked to assume. The cool back to filled in the missing pieces of skin and soothed the mind. Instead of Vader's head, there was nothing. He was trying to imagine what the sweet relief of death would have been. He tried to imagine what it would have been like if he had died on the banks of Mustafar, never having to face the life he currently lived. At the very least, he would be one with the Force, and one with his wife. His breathing apparatus hissed as he took a deep breath in his silent abode. Vader's eyes shot open. A communication came in from his master. The message told him that there was an intruder inside the Jedi Temple, one that needed to be dealt with immediately. Vader's eyes opened, and a yellow tint covered each eye. His vision was blurry, not that the Bacta tank could help his vision, but the burning he received on Mustafar ruined his eyesight. The sound of metallic gears began shifting and the top of the tank was removed. Vader was dragged upwards and out of the Bacta tank, hoisted up and missing all four ligaments. He felt like a husk of weightlessness. Immobilized. The back to slid off of his still charred skin and the pain began. The soothing texture of his abode dissipated. The room was chilled to near freezing and the liquid that used to surround him in what felt like a warm hug vanished. So similar it was to the presence his wife gave him. So close was it to the gentle texture of her embrace. And it was all taken away in a flash, in the blink of an eye if you will. The gears slammed together and the first addition to his body were his legs. They slammed onto the stubs at the bottom of his upper thighs and he could feel the shooting pain jab through his nervous system him all the way into his chest. This did nothing but feed the darkness that lived within him, but right now he wasn't even sure if he wanted to feel that darkness. Part of him wished he could find Obi-Wan on a green planet, a planet where there was peace and warmth and apologize. Part of him wished he could say one last thing to Ahsoka before she was reported missing, along with Jesse and Rex and the rest of the 501st dispatched to Mandalore. Anakin, no. Not Anakin. Vader blinked as his arms were slammed into the stubs where his biceps laid. There was no pain in this world greater than this. His breathing hollowed out like an asthmatic suffering. His breathing apparatus wasn't even attached to him yet, and all he could do was drown in the inability to breathe. Shallow breaths. His mind thinking about something Yoda had once said. It was said with a simple grin, but the Jedi Grand Master said, Breathe not so heavily, Skywalker. The Force will bind what is missing for you. Anakin never understood it. Vader could only resent it. Yoda said it to him when Anakin was training, and he was frustrated over what at in this moment in time was a minor inconvenience. But when it was said to him in the moment, it felt like life or death. The silly things that kids can only conceptualize in their short existence in the vast galaxy. Vader was brought back to the present when a heavy suit slammed down across his torso. More gears grinding could be heard as pieces were tied together and tightened as tight as they could possibly be, digging into his shoulders, his chest, and his back. It hurt like nothing else could. The worst part is, is that it wasn't over yet. Vader could feel the neck brace etch itself into his skin, and the vibration of the first piece of the mask was lowered onto his head. Vader scrunched his face, but he knew that he shouldn't. It only made things worse. The back piece of the helmet slammed into his head, and he felt dizzy for a moment before he was brought back to life by the echo of his boots slamming onto the ground. Silence filled the air until his breathing echoed across the chamber. Vader began his descent out of the room and towards the Imperial shuttle waiting for him. When Vader arrived at the Jedi Temple, he was taken aback. It felt like forever since he walked through these halls. A small part of him regretted what he did. He and the clones killed so many, many of which were just innocent children at the time. His boots creased the carpets of the Jedi Temple while he walked through, looking at the remnants of what was left behind. Scarred walls, lightsaber cuts, explosion creases, a lot of it. His feet carried him to the archives, where he saw a hooded figure and prepared to fight him. Assuming it was a Jedi, he ignited his lightsaber. When he did, the hooded figure whipped around and ignited a double bladed crimson lightsaber. Vader found this to be weird, but the weapons began to clash with each other. The two of them moved around. Vader, who was getting used to his suit, toyed with his figure until a familiar voice called out to him, requesting him to stop before killing the man. Sidious introduced Vader to the Grand Inquisitor, the leader of what would become the Jedi hunting squad of Inquisitorius. Vader put his lightsaber away and looked down at the Grand Inquisitor as he got up and picked up the pieces of his broken blade. Sidious requested that the two of them follow him. They did. Before Vader got behind his master, his head drifted away and he looked directly at the archives, where all the restricted information sat. Vader turned back around and listened to his thoughts, all of them encouraging him to take a look without his master's permission. The questions of what would have happened had he been patient passed through his mind again, which Sidious must have picked up on because immediately, Sidious asked Vader if he was ready for the tasks he would have to fulfill on behalf of the Empire. 
Vader, as per usual, jumped to attention and answered his master's request with urgency and readiness. Sidious instructed Vader to teach these new Inquisitors, and so Vader didn't. These individuals were all former Jedi. His job was to break them down and turn them into Sith acolytes. That would work on behalf of the Sith, and for the Emperor. It wasn't anything important in Sidious' eyes. He knew that the Inquisitors would break if they came across a few surviving Jedi Masters in the galaxy. To him, it was about two important things, breaking the will of the remaining Jedi and making Vader feel worthless, which both of these were accomplished. Vader knew that he was better than all these individuals. Some of them he recognized after all. However, he was better than them as a Jedi, and now they were doing what he had been doing his entire life, utilizing the darkness. Vader showed no mercy to them, essentially abusing them until he was done, before Sidious dismissed all of them. When Vader found himself some time, he returned to the Jedi Temple in secrecy and walked all the way to the archives. They were still locked, but he didn't care, ripping them apart and forcing himself into them. When Vader entered, he remembered his investigation during the Holocron heist with Obi-Wan and Yoda. He remembered what it was like to be a Jedi and to be a hero. He wasn't either of those anymore. He was simply forgotten to time, a hero of the past dead in the past. Vader snapped back to reality of the moment and looked over to the information. 25,000 years of knowledge sat here within these archives. Everything the Jedi had learned throughout their existence from light to dark, they had found the secrets of the Force and put them here. Part of it made Vader angry because they never shared any of it with him, referring to them as cowards. The rest of it made him feel like he wanted to slaughter the Jedi all over again for their adherence to corruption, even though that wasn't true. Vader went through the information looking for how to bring people back to life, which surprisingly was something the Jedi had discovered. However, it could only be accessed by a Grand Master. Master, someone with the purest of intentions. A being of the darkness could never access it, and it required the help of multiple Grand Masters. Darth was confused by what this meant, but during the era of the High Republic, there were periods of time where there were multiple Grand Masters, two of them that served alongside Grand Master Yoda at that time. It was an interesting thing, but Vader carried on until he found something else. This was something that actually caught his attention a lot more, and in all actuality, it was something his current master was working on in secrecy. It was the ability to force essence transfer into another being. The Jedi had discovered it, and in their vast knowledge, they perfected it. They knew its limitations, and they knew how it could be done properly. Ironically, someone of the dark side could not properly essence transfer. If someone was highly influenced by the dark side of the Force, then the new host would fall apart. It didn't matter how many midichlorians or how powerful an individual was in the Force. What mattered was how light or dark they were. The Jedi learned that an individual with more of a tendency to use the dark side could healthily transfer into another body. However, within a span of a week, or even shorter than that, the body would begin to decay, as if it was dead or dying. It was because the dark side, and how unnatural it was, and how it was essentially death on the Force itself. Because the Jedi worked in unison with the Force, they did not harm the Force itself, they did not disturb the continuous balance in the Force, and for the balance of a host of a body to begin with. The dark side user would continue to be able to exist, however, they learned that the individual would have to be hooked up to life support after a month worth of living in the new host. Of course, the dark side user could move from host to host or body to body, but it would kill several people in the process. Vader continued and learned that the Jedi had restricted this ability because it would impede the free will of the host body, unless that body was, of course, a clone of some sorts, which at the time of this information being concealed, clones were not a constant or even really much of a thing in the universe. Vader took this information and returned to his Bacta tank. Of course, he left the actual archives alone, as if they hadn't been touched by anyone, and he thought about everything he learned. It was ironic to Anakin. In a way, everything he ever wanted required him to be entirely loyal and adhere to the ways of the Jedi Code and the Jedi Order. What Yoda and Obi-Wan and Windu and Plo had told him over and over again in his time as a Jedi was true. While Vader was in his back to tank, he dwelled on it so much, again going back to that vision of him apologizing to Kenobi. It ate away at him, and now he could maybe possibly escape this pain. But if Vader wanted to essence transfer, he'd be made weak. He would give up everything he worked for under Palpatine's guidance. Vader couldn't decide on what he wanted. So, when he was dispatched on a mission to find and kill a Jedi, he left, but instead of going to the planet where the Jedi was, he stopped on Kamino. As Vader entered the facilities, he noticed a stark difference between eras. The Impera era was much different on Kamino, but there was also something else. The Kaminoans were seemingly disappearing. Vader's arrival was a little flabbergasting for the Kaminoans, but the Prime Minister welcomed Vader's presence and asked what he could do for him. Vader told the Prime Minister a fabrication, a lie of a situation. He told the Prime Minister that the Emperor was going to be shutting down the facilities of Kamino and Topoka City, which at this point Vader didn't know was actually true. He was just saying this to get what he wanted. He then informed Lama Su that he wanted a personal project to be done for him. Lama Su didn't know how to feel about this, 
this, but he listened. Vader told the Prime Minister that there had to be other Kaminoan facilities in which the scientists could relocate before everything was shot down by the Emperor. Lama Su knew of one on Borovio, but it had been undisclosed to the Emperor because it hadn't been in use for decades. Vader told Lama Su that they could keep this facility under wraps, and then they could work together to get rid of the Emperor. Lama Su was confused by this direction taken by Vader, but considering his pocketbook was empty and the Republic, now Empire, had to pay up, he would do it. Vader was glad business was good, and so Nala Se and a group of her best scientists took three blood samples from Anakin Skywalker's skin, which didn't feel too good with all the burns and stuff, and then they disappeared to the facilities at Borovio. Vader, on the other hand, found the Jedi on Utapau and executed them, which for the first time made Vader feel like a failure, a man who ruined the light. Darth Vader was a very torn man, unable to figure out what he wanted, and because of that he suffered for it. He felt terrible frequently, and now with the possibility of redemption and a start at a new life, he didn't even know how he could forgive himself. The rewards of using this ancient Jedi trick were only short term. He could maybe become Anakin again, but what would that get him? He would be stuck with no wife, no child, no friends, and essentially the greatest war criminal of his generation. Even though he was following orders, it still would sit on his chest like a rancor snuggling with him. Vader returned to his Emperor with the lightsaber of the Jedi of which he'd slain, to which the Emperor expressed his happiness with Vader's success. He then instructed Vader to go on a batch of missions that were incredibly important to the Empire. They weren't. Sidious knew that he could ruin Vader's mentality by forcing him to do monetary tasks, things that had no real purpose and were so boring that they could put an energized reek to sleep. These were working on Vader because they defeated his morale, and even with Vader's secret projects seemingly unnoticed by Palpatine, he had some inspiration to continue, but not much. In reality, it was very hard for Vader. He had to be the errand boy after being the hero of the Republic. During the Clone Wars, he was known by everyone, he was respected by everyone, he was loved by everyone too. He had everything, and he threw it all away for a false promise, and in a state he couldn't do anything. Even worse, he couldn't keep tabs on the Kaminoans because it could foil his plans. The Kaminoans were simply instructed to message him when the clone was finished, otherwise there would be no reason to message him. They had enough DNA to continue their work, and then Vader's hopes of a possible future were forever crushed. He received information from his master that Topoka City had been sunk to the bottom of the Kaminoan seas. He was confused as to why, and then Sidious informed him that the Kaminoans had worn out their welcome in the Empire. They had no real purpose in having them along for the ride any longer. They were not loyal, money-focused, greedy aliens with no purpose of serving the Galactic Empire. Vader asked about their leadership and their people. Sidious had no intention of unveiling his projects at Mount Tantus, so he informed Vader that they were executed for being treasonous against the Empire. Vader asked what their treason was, to which it was explained as attempting to betray the Empire via the usage of clones. Sidious was rather annoyed with all the questions that Vader had on the matter. There was an obvious miscommunication happening here, both of them hiding information from the other, and both of them could tell. Their meeting ended with Palpatine assuring that Vader knew that keeping secrets from his master would be seen as a visceral betrayal, and he would be treated accordingly. When the message ended, Vader thought he died. His heart broke into a million pieces the same way it had when Padme died, or at least when he learned that she had died due to him. He couldn't fathom how much he had lost because of Palpatine, and it was clear that that maybe, just maybe, the Jedi had the right point about not trusting Palpatine. But there was nothing he could feasibly do against his new master. Vader's new suit was made to be weak against electricity. Vader found that out immediately after Padme's death, too. When he cried out his terrible no, he used the Force incidentally, and it by happenstance hit his master. Sidious put Vader in his place by immediately electrocuting him, and informing him that if he ever did that again, it would be the last thing he did. This put Vader into a perpetual state of fear for his master. There was just no way he could ever challenge him, so he didn't. When Vader entered his meditation chambers inside of his personal Star Destroyer, he heard the voices of the Jedi from his past. His mind filled with the echoes of their voices and it haunted him. His core was rattled. He considered returning to the light just so that he could escape this hell, but that seemingly was no longer an option. His conflicted state of mind left him bereft for answers, and all he could do was think about how amazing it would be to breathe without a tube again, to walk with legs of his own again, to grab things with his hands of his own again. His heart was shattered, and he sat in his meditation table chambers and looked up at the ceiling. The pure whiteness of the chambers blinded his already dimmed eyesight. Vader closed his eyes and fell into a deep rest, one full of terrors that only a boy from Tatooine could imagine. Things that jarred his body while he was sleeping and made his heart jump when his eyes stormed open to a door behind him whip across its gears. Vader's mask was placed over his head and he responded to his duty. For two years, Vader would leave the light for what felt like forever as he turned back into the evil apprentice his master wanted him to become. That was until Vader received a message from Nala Se and told to report to Boravio when it was most convenient for him to do so. 
Vader left immediately, taking his personal TIE fighter and departing for the system, without informing anyone of where he was going. The trip through hyperspace was similar to Vader's meditation chamber's moments, flickering a light between the darkness like a thunderstorm in the dead of night. The darkness took over for the most part of those two years, but there still remained a glimmer of hope, and now that it was restored, Vader could possibly take advantage of it. When Vader arrived on Bora Vio, he got out of his TIE fighter and made his way for the interior of the base. He was greeted by a number of Kaminoan scientists that took him into the functioning room of operation. When Vader entered, he was greeted by Nala Se herself. She admitted that the project was stressful, especially due to the Empire hunting her and her fellow scientists, but they completed the project for him. Vader requested to see it and she led him directly to the cloning pod. When Vader looked in, he was taken aback. He looked into the hollow body of Anakin Skywalker. Nala Se told him that they used the gene that they gave him to create an age-appropriate version of him. They knew that if the body was too young, it wouldn't fulfill his request. They then told Vader that unlike the clones of the Grand Army of the Republic, this clone was not outfitted with any personality. It was just simply a husk of body. Vader requested that they take the body out of the Bacta tank, so the Kaminoans listened, and they began to remove the body of Anakin Skywalker's clone. Vader removed himself from his evil persona and began to neutralize himself within the Force, realizing that the freedom he longed for sat directly in front of him. All he had to do was reach out and he could attain the Force he wished for. It would be that simple, everything he wanted was just in front of him. Of course, it didn't include Padme, but it could be the right steps towards- Vader was thrown from his feet and slammed into the wall across the room. A voice echoed through the halls with a sinister laugh, telling Vader that he had done everything Palpatine needed to accomplish. Sidious turned towards Nala Se and shot lightning at her, ripping her into pieces and shattering her body as it fell lifeless to the ground. Sidious turned to Vader and shot more lightning at him, covering Vader's entire body in pain. Sidious told Vader that he was foolish to believe that he could do anything without his knowledge. Vader fell back more and Sidious shot more lightning before stopping. He could hear the difference in Vader's vocalizer. He stopped and turned towards the clone, using the force to lower it to the floor. Sidious transferred himself into Anakin Skywalker's clone. Vader looked at his body as it came to life and a sinister smile crossed his face. Sidious began to laugh feeling his evil powers take control of a new host, one far younger and seemingly more powerful. Sidious shot lightning at Vader once more, covering his body in electricity, and as Sidious was enjoying his new body, three of his fingers popped off. It shocked him. He was beyond confused. Vader came back from his pain as he looked at Sidious. His face was melting, and he was obviously falling apart. The Jedi were right. The dark side was far too powerful for a host's body to handle. The Dark Lord began to lose control, and he stumbled over into the wall. The few Kaminoans saw Vader as their only way of surviving. They helped Vader up, telling him that the body that Sidious had was the original demo body. One of the scientists pressed the control and pulled a body out of the back to tank that was hidden behind the other. Vader turned his attention towards the body and crawled over to it, the metallic body aching in his lungs in more pain than they ever were on Mustafar. He closed his eyes and remembered something from his old days as a Jedi. Vader began to chant it to himself quietly and slowly. I am one with the Force, and the Force is with me. I am one with the Force, and the Force is with me. The last time he said it, it was heard from his own voice, and when his eyes opened, he was inside of his own body. He looked at his hands. Both of them were there. It had been six years since he saw the right hand, and it had been three years since he saw any of his other lingabins. Vader stood to his feet. He closed his eyes and focused on the light side of the Force, seeing what the dark side could do to Sidious. He reached out his hand and pulled Vader's lightsaber to his hands, and it can look down at Sidious, who was crumbling, feeling the pain that Vader suffered through forever. Anakin gripped the blade with his hand. He could feel all of it. He hadn't been able to feel anything in so long. All of his senses burned away, and in a moment, he committed himself to the light. Anakin ignited the crimson weapon and shoved it forward. However, having been so used to being inside the suit of Vader, he stumbled and the blade slammed through Sidious's neck and then deignited as he dropped it. Anakin crashed into the wall and felt pain throughout his body. The Kaminoans ran over and helped him up to see if he was alright, and instead of reacting to the pain, he started laughing. He couldn't believe he could feel it. This was nothing compared to what he felt as Vader. It was not pain. He leapt to his feet and felt light as a feather. The suit wasn't surrounded. Him, and as he looked down, he saw the body of the Anakin clone and the body of Sidious. Without any other Sidious clones around the galaxy completed not on Tantus, Jakku, or Exegol, he vanished. Being killed by the prophesized chosen one, Anakin stumbled. He told the Kaminoans that he hadn't stood on his own two feet in forever. They looked at him and then back at the ground. Their confusion was obvious because firstly, how the hell did he get from the suit to the clone and what the hell just happened? But they were happy to not share in the same fate as Nala Se. Skywalker felt his arms and his chest and his legs and everything was where it was supposed to be. He was a man and in this moment, having realized how far he had truly fallen, he vanished. He could try and face down the entirety of the Empire, but what good would that do? Without leadership, it would crumble. It was after all three years old. 
Anakin had to work on himself. He couldn't just go back into the galaxy. There was still so much darkness that resonated within him. If he allowed that darkness to take control, then he could lose everything all over again. And having lived a life full of darkness, that was something he couldn't live with doing to himself. Anakin disappeared to the Outer Rim, which is where Borovio was, and he decided that he should return to his home planet. He had no intention of visiting his stepbrother. He just knew that if he could come to love the planet that gave him an unfair disadvantage to the start of life, then he could possibly come to live in the full light of the Force. Anakin took his TIE fighter and disappeared from Borovio, leaving the survivors to make do with what they could. When Anakin landed on Tatooine, he sold his vessel which gave him a nice sum of credits, and he disappeared into the crowds. He felt the two suns rain down on him with their incredible heat. As a child, he hated it. After having been Darth Vader, it was calming, it was warm, and it was peace. Having lived with the suit for three years changed his entire perception of reality and the life that he led. Not everything was as dreary as he imagined it. Anakin found himself inside of a small cantina by himself, listening to the music and waiting on his own purpose to come to him. He knew something laid ahead of him, but what was it? While Anakin figured out who he was, the Empire turned into a mess. The Grand Inquisitor and his Inquisitorius were now the strongest beings in the galaxy, as it seemed. Of course, without City Surveyor, that's what it looked like. Aside from them, Moff Tarkin was vying for power, while Masa Meda, who was Palpatine's right-hand man and overseer of every Senate session, naturally believed the role was his. Others who wanted power were Director Krennic, who was in charge of Project Stardust, but it was at his bare bones at the moment, just essentially holograms put together in blueprints. Thrawn, on the other hand, had joined the Empire shortly beforehand, and was currently on board of a Gazanti, which wasn't much of a vessel to be on. He wasn't even in command of it. With so many individuals believing they deserved power, the Empire imploded upon itself and began to struggle without a powerful leader like Palpatine. The Sith Lord may have been evil, but he knew how to keep individuals in line and to establish loyalty to him. Anakin on Tatooine had no clue about this, and after spending a month on the city of Mos Espa, where he grew up, he would move himself into the desert. He'd been a nomad for most of his time here on Tatooine, simply helping people who needed help and using the Force rarely. He would meditate, but part of him feared using the Force in the way that Palpatine had. Losing fingers wasn't something he wanted. Anakin then considered the idea of purifying his lightsaber and trying to unify himself with his body. He didn't remember everything inside the holocron, and he was much too afraid to try and journey back to Coruscant to try and grab it. In the span of a month, the Empire entered a civil war with itself. The few remaining clone troopers turned against their leaders, and the civil war was ripping apart the Empire. It was a tragedy for the people who lived on Imperial worlds who faced the brunt of it. But out of the chaos, the man who worked on the Gazanti saw strategy in mind to rip the corruption out of the Empire and defend democracy in place. Regardless, Anakin walked into the desert and placed himself down near the rocks placed around the landscape. The only reason for doing so is that it had shade. He accidentally stumbled onto someone's cave house and so he left it alone so that he could focus on himself and on his force. When Anakin started, he vanished into his mind for nearly a week. It didn't feel like a week to him, but when he returned, he looked at the lightsaber. He looked at the sky, it was a sunset, so seemingly only a day had passed in his mind. He held the blade in his hands and pressed the ignition switch. The sound of the lightsaber echoed through the rock formations and into Anakin's ears. He felt at one, not just with a blade that emitted pure white, but himself. He no longer felt that he could become separated from his body, because it was as if the body he resided in was the body he started with. Anakin looked up to the sky and thought of going back to Coruscant to see that if the energy in the light side would allow him to access a holocron that he discovered that would allow him to bring back the dead, the life. He loved his wife with all of his heart, but in this moment he thought that maybe he should just allow fate to play out. Would it necessarily be right for him to bring her back after having been the one to kill her? There are only so many mistakes that could be undone, and being a key part of the construction of the Empire made him feel as if what he had done would have been sacrilege to his wife. While Anakin held his blade, his eyes drew him to the corner of his peripheral vision. He looked over and deigniting the purified lightsaber immediately. His eyes landed on a rugged man, a man who was once known as General Obi-Wan Kenobi. Anakin put the lightsaber down slowly. He knew that Obi-Wan was a deadly warrior, but something was off. Why didn't Anakin sense him through the Force? There had to be some reason for it. Why couldn't he feel his presence? Anakin put his hands up, and Obi-Wan couldn't figure out how to react. He knew he was looking at Anakin, but his mind couldn't wrap his mind around the fact that he was looking at Anakin. The last time he saw Skywalk, he was burning alive at the bottom of a lava river. Obi-Wan thought Anakin was dead, but clearly he wasn't. Anakin slowly stood up, still with his hands above his head, as he told Obi-Wan that he was sorry for everything. Obi-Wan's jaw hung open. He couldn't decide what to do. Anakin hoped that Obi-Wan would embrace him in a hug. At least, it's what he envisioned for himself, in his mind's eye. It would have been perfect as a reaction, but that was just in Anakin's made-up mind. Anakin stepped forward slowly, and his master asked how at all this was possible. Anakin knew it was far-fetched, but he told his master that he could explain it all if he gave him time. Obi-Wan didn't carry his lightsaber with him, so there was no means of which he could defend himself from this. 
Obi Wan had no option but to trust Anakin. So he walked forward and sat down on a rock and allowed Anakin to speak. Anakin sat back down where he was, and the two of them talked for hours. Obi Wan wasn't going to just trust Anakin, but it seemed as if Anakin had learned his lesson. At the end of their talk, Anakin told Obi Wan that he returned the Tatooine to become one with himself and begin the process to become one with the light. Obi Wan didn't know how to process all of this, and he looked over at the lightsaber crafted by a Sith and purified by a Jedi. There were people during the era of the High Republic who wielded pure lightsabers, and Obi Wan knew of that. So with his knowledge, he could accept that Anakin had returned to the light enough to purify his lightsaber. Obi Wan asked Anakin about what else he knew, and he told Obi Wan that Padme had died and their child as well, to which Obi-Wan kept quiet, listening to everything Vader had undergone and how Anakin was overcoming it. Obi-Wan told Anakin that the following day, they could come together and continue Anakin's journey into the light. When the morning came, the two of them went to the Lars homestead, which Anakin thought was weird, especially since his cave was situated in a position to oversee the homestead. When they arrived, Owen and Beru were shocked to see Anakin, but Owen was annoyed to see Obi-Wan. He was aware that Kenobi was overseeing them and watching over them, this was ridiculous. Anakin was still confused as to why he was here until Beru went in and brought out a three-year-old boy. Anakin still didn't make the connection until it was made known to him that it was Anakin's child. Anakin, when he realized, nearly burst into tears. When he realized that he didn't destroy everything he loved, and upon realizing that, Anakin wasn't truly evil anymore. Obi-Wan would reveal that Luke wasn't the only child, the other one being Leia. Anakin couldn't believe his ears, but there was only one issue. Owen was unlikely to give Luke up. Of course, Brew, on the other hand, was more accepting of the idea, but Owen was not. Obi-Wan told Anakin that Bale and Brea Organa were the ones who adopted Leia. Anakin over time would get a chance to restore the children to his own care. Of course, being that Obi-Wan had his best friend back, he would retrieve their lightsabers from the desert and return Anakin's to him. Skywalker would avoid the idea of resurrecting his wife, having accepted that if fate was in play to take her away from him, then he needed to accept that not everything was in his control. Ben and Anakin would move to Naboo, where Anakin would have to face Padme's family and earn their love back. Even though they didn't know he killed her, they knew that he wasn't at her funeral. With the grandchildren and their son-in-law returning to them, they would start to rebuild their family. Anakin would remain loyal to Padme for the rest of his life, even in her death. As for Kenobi, he would find residence on Naboo, so that he could be a part of Luke and Leia's lives as Uncle Kenobi. The Empire, on the other hand, after two and a half years of civil war, would reform with a democracy, after seeing what tyranny could do to their fragile system. With the Sith mostly gone, aside from the dark acolytes such as Maul and the Inquisitorious, the dark side would die out, as light would return to the forefront of the galaxy. And a new future full of potential peace and that ladies and gentlemen is our story again special thanks to galvin gaming tristan darth revan pimp daddy bane the last jedi apollo jedi sloth mad Maddie studios anakin 003 lemon knight rex the wolf the man with three first names dark saint 46 and lord denwing for supporting the channel smash that like button you know what to do let's talk about our story uh this story has been requested obviously for a while but this was a lot of fun to do um this story was really fun because like, the twist, my favorite part of the story, I'm not going to lie, is the twist of Palpatine showing up at Boravia with Anakin, or Vader at that at that point, because I don't think, like, Sidious is a genius, and, like, he's the main villain of Star Wars, so I kind of have to kill him off if I want the light side to win in videos, and that just happens to be, like, a lot of videos, um, just the direction of the story, the name of the what-if, just being like, oh, what if this character didn't do something stupid? Like, it usually results in Palpatine losing. However, I wanted to give Palpatine some time, especially in a story like this where I could set up Anakin's return to the light, I wanted to give Palpatine time to be like, oh, actually, I know about this, because Palpatine is, well, Palpatine. He knows Anakin, he's the one that corrupted Anakin, he's the one that put voices into, uh, Ben Solo's mind, so he's, he's this continuous genius throughout time that's really good at manipulation, and so I don't really see a way for him not to figure it out. I know the title says, what if, secretly, but Palpatine is still going to figure it out. Uh, Palpatine is still Palpatine, and I think I think his ignorance, it's like, I think that's the only thing that would get in the way of him, I think is that he would be ignorant of the situation. I think he would just be like, oh, I can, I can force transfer, because I already know about it, like force essence transfer, and not realize that the dark side plagues him. That, of course, is something that I was taking from what is established in the sequels, is, you know, Palpatine force transferred and he was like, oh, I'm cool, and then it turns out he was just too powerful and too dark side powerful to be in in the body of another being, uh, a clone if you will in that scenario. But so for this for this Palpatine transfers in Anakin and when he starts using his his incredible dark side power which dark uh, which lightning uh, force lightning is his like biggest thing, 
that's when he completely destroys the body that he's inhabiting. And so because he does that, he immediately loses all control and he starts falling apart because the dark side is, is like a leech. It's not like a leech, it's like bigger, like a, a monster leech, like, like a monster leech. Like it just eats everything and it's so corrupt and so vile. And so him using the dark side would destroy that clone because the clone having just been existing was, I guess, you know, pure in its own way, and the light side doesn't impede that. So, say for example, Obi Wan with the Force transfer or Force essence transfer, he could without doing it. He's powerful, but he wouldn't destroy the body. Same with Yoda. It's like that's how I've how I've kind of conceptualized this. So, anyways, I hope you all enjoyed that. I hope you all enjoyed that nice little twist there. I, I kind of set it up where it was possible for a second part, but I have no intentions of doing a second part. So, if you want a second part, uh, let me know, and that might happen. Otherwise, I love you all. Spread the love, and always remember, my friends, may the Force with you.